last night we had an amazing spaghetti supper. And so this morning, what do I have to talk about? There we go. <laughs> Fasting, right, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of like, why do we get stuck with these topics, you know? I don't know how to talk to Ray and Lou about that one. But as we talk about fasting, we need to, to know that of all the spiritual disciplines that we talk about, I really believe that fasting is probably the one discipline that is most misunderstood and, and probably not practiced much at all. Now, okay, let's just be a little honest here this morning. When we talk of fasting and doing without food, for the majority of us people, I would have to say maybe the last time we fasted was when we had to get a blood test or to get ready for a colonoscopy. <laughs> You've been there, right? Okay. Yeah, all right, I'm not the only one who was like that. Okay. But here's the thing. Why is it that, that we have this huge misunderstanding of what fasting is all about, and why don't we do it? And as I thought about that, I came up with a couple of reasons. I don't know if they're any good or not, but, but the first reason is what I would call a bad press. And, and by that, I mean um, for two things. First of all, we have been taught in our society to, to remain healthy. We have to have three square meals a day, right? plus a healthy snack in between, right? I mean, you just read, that's what it tells us that we have to have. And so we have this told to us time after time. And there's actually been some bad press about fasting. Oh, you can't fast, it's really bad for you. That's not true. Now, if you don't believe me, after service, talk to Colin Marr, all right? He actually did some research and found out that as we fast over a period of a couple of days, your body kind of gets rid of these old cells that are just kind of hanging around, not doing anything. And it just kind of like takes care of them and gets rid of them and renews brand new cells that are good for you. And I don't know if any of you have ever fasted for a period of time, but, but if you do, sometimes you will notice that your tongue gets kind of coated. I don't, it's kind of nasty, but you just kind of get, ooh, bad breath and all that kind of stuff. But it's all those toxicities and dead cells and everything is coming out of your body. In reality, fasting is actually good for your health, that we should be doing that every so often. But not only have we been told bad press this way, I mean, we, we, we think of fasting, and I don't know about you, but your mind probably goes back to the biblical times, and when people fasted, then what did they do? They took ashes, you know, and threw on themselves and put on sackcloth and all this kind of stuff. And if you go back into church history, into the uh, Middle Ages, you would have monks who would go out into the desert and uh, fast for days and days and days and wear ragged clothes and, you know, shallow eyes and all these kinds of things. And so we kind to get this idea in the back of our minds. Well, you know, if, if a Christian were to fast, I mean, they're going to be kind of like hollow-eyed and weak and kind of disheveled and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of like, whoa, people who do that are really weird, right? Come on, be honest. You know, I mean, who would do that in this day and age? Really? I mean, come on. We just don't do those types of things. And so I think part of the reason why in our society today, we don't fast. is because of all the bad press that fasting has received. But I think there's another reason, and this one may be a little bit closer to home, and it's what I would say would be this huge abundance and appetite that we have for food. Now, here in Stovall, I mean, we have grocery stores just all over the place. I mean, there is no way we could ever run out of food. Most of us probably have more food in our refrigerators and our pantries than some villages in Africa have in the whole village. I mean, seriously. We have so much food, it's just there available for us. And it's this idea that, okay, as North Americans, as Canadians, it's our right to always be satisfied and full 24-7. You get hungry in the middle of the night, what do you do? Go down to the fridge, right? I mean, there's always something there for you. Now, here's a quick question for you, all right? Trivia. If you were to visit every restaurant, diner, coffee shop, pizza place, 
once a week, just in Stovall, just in the town of Stovall, how many weeks would it take you to visit every restaurant, coffee shop, diner, whatever? Anybody want to make a guess? How many weeks would you think it would take you? In other words, how many restaurants and things do we have in town? How many? Five zero. Fifty? Hundred and fifty. Hundred and fifty. Not that many. All right. Very close. According to Google, if you do Google Maps type thing, we have 54 different types of restaurants here in town. It'll take you over a year, okay, once a week, a year just to visit. I mean, it's just pizza places. We just got Papa, jo Papa, Papa John's. Anybody here of Papa John's? Down, big, big down in the States. They're now here in Stovall. I'm just like, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, how much pizza can you eat? But that's the thing. You see, we have all this stuff thrown at us, and we think it's our right, our, you know, Canadian God-given right to eat all the time. And so because of that, when you talk about fasting, it's like, whoa, no, 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 no. That's for those people who are really kind of strange and weird and whatever, that we just don't do that. And so what I want us to do this morning is really just take some time to take a look at what does the Bible say about fasting. And as we do that, hopefully we'll understand it's not something out there for the strange and weird folks, okay? It is something that is really good and available and helps in our spiritual lives to do. So let me begin by giving you a definition. And this definition is from Richard Foster. Again, we've used a number of books um, in our study for this, and his is called Celebration of Discipline. And he basically he says this, that throughout scripture, fasting refers to abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. Now just remember that. It's just not the idea of not eating, but it's the idea of doing it for a spiritual purpose. And as we look at scripture, we actually find that there's basically uh, three types of fasts. I guess we could call them that way. And again, the first one would be called like a normal fast. This is basically to abstain from food, but not from water. So, in other words, you would eat, but you wouldn't. Um, you wouldn't eat, but you would drink water. And the best example of that is of Jesus. If you remember, uh, when he was just baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert. And it says there that when he was tempted by the devil for forty days, Jesus ate nothing at all that time and became very hungry. And the reason we say this is probably a normal fast is because it doesn't say he was thirsty, all right? He was hungry, so it's very possible that he would drink water, but he didn't eat anything for 40 days. And when we get into it, we will find a lot of times that the normal fast is the most general type that is used and talked about in Scripture. But there's also another fast, which is called a partial fast. And by this, this means that it's just a restriction from certain foods, but not total abstention. In other words, it's basically saying that we're not going to be eating certain types. Best example I came across was in Daniel. Remember when Daniel and his three friends were taken and they were caught and they were going to be trained? And they were offered all of this royal food from, you know, the government there. And they basically said, hey, wait a minute, no, no, no. Please test your servants for 10 days. Just give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. So in other words, they were in a sense of partial fast, that they wouldn't do that. And, and some of us probably have tried a partial fast, um, sometimes during Lent. Have any of you ever given up, you know, like candy or pizza or desserts or anything like that during Lent? Yeah, some of us probably have done something like that. That is considered a partial fast. Fast, that we're just not getting rid of everything but just certain things and we just kind of do that. But again, the reason that we do that um, as, as we do it through and is really to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm taking some time to just say, no, I'm denying myself of these things just for a spiritual purpose. So then you have what is called an absolute fast. And what this is, this is basically abstaining from both food and water. And um, there's a couple of examples that I came across in Scripture. The one that kind of caught my attention was Saul or Paul. Do you remember when he encountered Jesus um, on the way to Damascus? 
It tells us in Acts chapter 9 that for three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. In other words, this is a total fast from drinking, eating, everything. But usually, no, not usually, I think in most cases, you can only do it for about three days. Your, your body cannot function, cannot survive longer than three or four days without food and water, that you have to have liquid to do that. Now, the only exception that I found for sure in Scripture where this didn't happen, and this would be maybe another one, would be what's called a supernatural fast. And this is 40 days without food and water. Anybody have any idea who went 40 days and 40 nights without food and water? Elijah. Elijah is a possibility, yep. We don't know for sure. It doesn't tell us that for sure, but that, that's a good one. Elijah, and there's one other person. There were two instances I found. Moses, that's right. Moses. It says there in Deuteronomy, Moses said, When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant of the Lord um, had made with you, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. All right. That's a supernatural fast. There's no way that Moses could have done that humanly speaking. That's impossible. It had to be a supernatural act. And so, you know, in that case, you know, unless God really tells you specifically that's what he's doing for you, I wouldn't try that one, all right? That's kind of like really on the edge. But again, it's a supernatural fast, and in the scripture, like we say, there's probably only about two instances of that happening. So those are the types of fasts that they have. And then we need to see, okay, so how do these fasts work? Well, in scripture, a lot of times, the most common type of fast that takes place are what I would call private fasts. In other words, just you alone with God. If you go back into the Old Testament, you'll read about King David. He fasted on a number of occasions just on his own. Daniel was another one. Um, he did it among with his groups, but there were a number of times that he just did it by himself. Jesus, when he was out there in the wilderness, right, he would do that. And, and so he would have it. And Paul, um, in his journeys and things like that, he would pass on his own. And again, I think a lot of times it's important for us just to have those times where we spend time alone with God through fasting. But beyond that, there's also what I would call a congregational fast or a church-wide fast. And in Joel chapter 2, we read this. Um, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. In other words, this is a call for the whole church, in a sense, to come together to fast. From the babies all the way up to the elderly, that we all do this together. That, 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 that's been a call to do that. And then on occasions, there's actually been what would we considered a national fast. And uh, this one I found in Second Chronicles. Um, Jehoshaphat found out that um, a number of different tribes around them were coming against them, uh, against Judah. And he was alarmed, it says. And so Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for who? All Judah. For the whole country. And in our history, there have been times where countries have actually called for times of prayer and fasting. Uh, during the World War I and World War II, I know that England called for a couple of days uh, there of national fasting. And go back into your history. Um, look up the miracle of Den um, Don Dunkirk? Dunkirk? Dunkirk. Um, and some people basically say because there was a day of prayer and fasting, God did a miraculous thing back then. All right? And even in World War I, I did some study um, because England had called for a day of fasting and prayer um, that it brought an end to the war. So, again, this whole idea of having a national day of fasting. Now, having looked at that then, my next question then is, okay, so these are the types of fasting that there are, but why should we fast? What should motivate us to fast? Why should we do this as a part of one of our spiritual practices? I mean, what, what's there for us? Well, first and foremost, now get a hold of this. Jesus expects his followers to fast. 
Now, he doesn't command us to do that. Nowhere in Scripture do I see a command that you have to fast. But it's just expected. In Matthew chapter 6, and we'll look into this a little bit more, Jesus said, but, you know, when you fast, you see that? Not if, not maybe, but when. It's just expected that you would do that. And you're saying, well, Tim, maybe you're kind of pulling that out of context. No, 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 no. Look at the rest of Matthew chapter 6. The chapter begins by Jesus talking about us giving to help the need. What does he say there? When you give. It's expected. You know, you just are going to do that. Read a little bit further down. Jesus says, when you pray. You see? Not if you pray, but when you pray. You see, just as God expects us to pray and to give, he expects us to fast. It's just a natural expectation. And so because of that, it is something that we really should be thinking about and say, hey, wait a minute. If Jesus expects us to do that, we should do that. And if you read on, um, Jesus was in the home of Matthew. And uh, some of John the Baptist's uh, disciples came in and they asked Jesus, Jesus, why is it that we fast but your disciples aren't fasting? What was his response? Hey, we're parting right now because, you know, the bridegroom's here. But soon he will leave and when that happens, then, then they will fast. And so it's just expected that we would do that. Jesus expects his followers to fast. A second reason is that fasting really helps, um, in a sense, to allow us to use the other spiritual practices. Now, I have not seen any place where fasting is done just in and of its own. Again, it's for a spiritual reason, for a spiritual purpose. And that fasting often goes in conjunction with a number of the other practices like prayer, confession, um, study, meditation, those types of things. It, it helps us kind of clear the deck, as it were, to really focus in on some of these other disciplines to apply, to apply them to our lives. And so in that case, it really helps us to more effectively practice, as it were, the other disciplines. And then also, it will help us to really maintain balance in our lives. Um, it's very easy for us how can I say this? Okay, to, to allow, and I know food's not necessarily a non-essential, but the abundance food, okay? To allow things like that just to begin to control our lives. Um, and it can be things that aren't bad in and of themselves. Food's not bad. I mean, it's okay. Um, social media, not necessarily bad. It's okay. Uh, sports. Movies, TV, all those types of things are okay. But here's the thing. If we allow those things to start just filling up our whole lives so that we don't have time, you hear that? To do other things, like to get into God's Word, to spend time praying, you know, to do good things. All of a sudden, those things begin controlling us. And it's interesting, I, I, I grabbed this verse because of what Paul said here. He said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but what? I will not be dominated by anything. You see that? He is basically saying, listen, I'm not going to let these things control me. But I'm going to make sure that I, through God's strength and power, will control those things. And one of the best ways for us to do that is through fasting. Because it's basically teaching our bodies to say, hey, wait a minute, who's in control here? You know, when your stomach starts growling a little bit and you start feeling kind of hungry and whatever, and it's kind of like, no, wait a minute, you're not controlling me. You see, I am controlling you. And so fasting can help us to be able to do that. All right, now... Since we talked about why we should fast, why shouldn't we fast? And I thought about this one too, all right? There are some reasons why we probably should not fast, and one could be a medical, medical condition. Um, some folks have to eat three square meals a day, um, you know, diabetes and different things like that. That, that. You may have that, or you're taking medications and you can't skip a meal. You have to have, you know, medications with, with, with your meal. So in that case, yeah, it, it, you shouldn't be fasting. Um, but, but again, just remember that you could do a partial fast. 
okay? Not necessarily abstaining from food, but you could abstain from desserts or cookies or, you know, candy or, you know, certain types of foods or things like that, or even certain activities. And I was told not to talk about golfing today, so I won't. But, you know, there's certain activities, uh, social media, take a fast from that. Take a fast, as it were, even from watching television, uh, from watching sports, or doing something like that. You know, that you break away from those things. It doesn't necessarily have to be food, okay? But it can be other activities that you can actually fast from. Just stop. And again, it's not just to stop for stopping for whatever, but as you take that time away from those things, use it, as it were, to pray, to study, you know, to get into God's Word, to do those things. So you can do that, all right? So you shouldn't do it for that. Another reason is to show others just how spiritually we really are, okay? It's kind of like, yeah, I fast uh, once a week. Pretty good, huh? You guys? Oh, man. You're kind of, but look at me. Look what I do, okay? And it's really interesting. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, really hammers this home. Listen to what he says. He says, and when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. You get what they're saying here? Oh, I'm fasting this week, you know, it's just really bad. Oh, but I'm really spiritual. I really love Jesus, okay? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? So you can try and show others just how great you are. And what does Jesus say? Okay. Just let you know, you've already received a reward. People will say, oh, wow, he's really spiritual. That's it, folks. That's what you get. Nothing more. And it's kind of like, why? Why do we do it? How should we fast then? What does Jesus say? He goes on the next one. He says, but when you fast, okay, Anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. You got that? In other words, what's he saying? Okay, you're fasting, so what do you do? You get up, you shave. Well, guys, you shave. Ladies, you won't do that. But, I mean, you put on your makeup, ladies, and you do that. You do your hair. You do the whole thing. You look just plain old normal. You go to work. You just do the regular things. You don't have to show everybody else that you're doing it. Now, does that mean that you have to hide it from everybody? Well, certain people will probably know if you're fasting, the rest of your family and others. And it's not this idea that we have to hide it, but it's this idea that why, you know, am I telling somebody else that I'm fasting? Is it so that it draws attention to me? Or is it just to say, no, 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 that's, it's, that's okay. You see, it's, it's this whole attitude of, of motive that is behind it. And so we should never fast to try and show others just how spiritual we are. Another reason we should never fast is to try to manipulate God. Now, let me just say here that I know that there are some people who basically say, okay, if I fast, God's then obligated to answer my prayer. Okay? If I pray and fast, God's obligated to do it. I mean, it's kind of like, how would I say? You know, if I pray, that's one thing. But if I fast and pray, God, I mean, that's like, you got to come through on that one. All right? We can't manipulate God. We can't do that. In the Old Testament, take some time this afternoon and go through Isaiah chapter 58. Amazing chapter. Great chapter on, on, on the real reason to fast. And in this... The people are basically saying this. Why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen it? In other words, they're basically saying, okay, God, listen, we fasted. We've been praying and you never answered us. What's the big deal here? Come on. Haven't you seen what we're doing here? And what's God's response to him? Listen to this. This is pretty strong. He says this. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in the striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Wow. Hear that? 
Just because we fast doesn't mean, you know, we're bending God's arms. And I know that some people basically think, okay, if, if we fast, you know, if, if I do this, um, you know, God then has to do whatever we want. But here's the thing. God is never manipulated by what we do. Some of us think, okay, if I fast and do all these types of things, I'll be on good, God's good side. You know, I'll be kind of special for him. You know, he'll, he'll really look down at me and say, wow, good job. You know, no, 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 no. Nothing we do, understand this, nothing that we do can, can manipulate God, can, can basically make God love us more, do whatever. You under, I understand that. The only way that we can really have a relationship with him is because of who we put our trust in. Paul says it this way in Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works. Not by anything that you do. But what? It's, it's really through Jesus Christ for our faith in him. Why? So that nobody can boast. Nobody can boast about this. You see, it's only through our faith in Jesus Christ that we have this relationship with him. And it's nothing that we do, so we can never manipulate him, all right? So that's kind of why we shouldn't fast. But now the next question is when? When should we fast? And let me just kind of go through these quickly. First of all, in response to a crisis. Most of the times when I was looking through, in the Bible, um, people fasted because of a crisis. It could have been a national crisis, it could have been a personal crisis, a number of different things. Um, the example that I came across here was Esther. Do you remember Esther? Um, she was married to King Xerxes, and uh, Haman came up and tried to, out of jealousy, destroy all of the Jews there in Persia. And um, Mordecai found out about it and went to Esther and said, Esther, you need to go to your husband, the king. And you need to try and convince him that he shouldn't kill all the Jews. Well then, the reason that Esther became queen is because the previous queen actually just walked in on the king unexpected and you can't do that. And she was taken care of. And so Esther knew, hey, I can't go in and just see him whenever I want. Because if I do, he might just say, you know, that's the end of you. So what does she say? Listen to this. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Hear that? Crisis. Huge thing going on. So what do we do? Let's take some time to pray and fast. Another reason that we need to do it is really to seek God's guidance. Uh, when we have decisions coming up in our lives that we have to do, and we want to check and say, God, you know, what is it that you want? Um, Paul and Barnabas, when they went out and they were establishing churches, it tells us in Acts chapter 14, that they appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting. You hear that? They committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. In electing people to govern, as it were, the churches that they had established, they took time to pray and fast before they made that decision, before they decided, okay, this is the person that should do that. And I think sometimes we just need to back off and that we should do that too. That we should just take time to seek God's guidance through prayer and fasting. And another reason is really to overcome the attacks of the enemy. Um, if we're struggling with a certain sin or temptation or something like that, um, we need to, to take time to pray. Um, Jesus, when he was led by the Spirit, you know, he was tempted. What did he do? He fasted and prayed. And so you have that. And, and we need to understand that in this day and age, we're living, how can I say, that, that there's a spiritual warfare going on. And sometimes we kind of ignore that, but it really is happening. Um, Paul talks about this in, in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are involved in a spiritual battle. Let me jump back to Daniel just quickly, because there, th th this is what comes up. Daniel um, had this vision, and it was so disturbing. It says here, that at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks, okay, three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So in other words, he was doing a partial fast and praying. God, what is going on here? You show me this. What does this vision mean? What's going on? What's happening? And he did it for three weeks, 21 days. Why? Why wasn't God answering him? Read on down in the chapter. Listen to what it says. Then he continued, this is an angel who actually appeared before Daniel then. He said, Daniel, do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Three weeks. Got that? 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Spiritual warfare is taking place. And we need to understand that. And at times, we need to be praying and fasting. And, and if we sense this attack of the enemy, please take time to do that. That's what this is about, all right? And then another time, it's to express just a deep sense of repentance for sin. Um, I think sometimes we can very, how can I say, half-heartedly pray and say, oh, well, you know, God forgive me, I messed up, okay? And they just kind of go on. But, but this is understanding like, wait a minute, this is serious. It's kind of like, wow, I am so, so sorry for what I did. As a form of my repentance, I'm going to fast and do it. Remember the story of Jonah? Anybody remember that from Sunday school days? You know, Jonah and the big fish and whatever. He was supposed to go to Nineveh and talk to the people there. God was coming to destroy that city because of their wickedness. Okay? And so he went the opposite direction, remember? And then, you know, they threw him off the boat and he got swallowed and spit up. Yeah, that's kind of nasty, right there on the shore. And, and so he actually went into Nineveh and he preached to them and said, listen, guys, God's going to destroy you because of your wickedness. And when that news came to the king, okay, of Nineveh, this was his response. When Joshua's, Joshua, uh, Jonah's, not Joshua, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them come up or let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Fasting and repentance. Boom. And what was God's response to that? What did God do? When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Okay? He saw, you guys are really serious. You're fasting. You're praying. You're giving up your evil ways. They repented. You know, it's not the fasting that turned his mind, but it was because they turned from their wicked ways. But to show that they were serious, fasting went along with it. 
And I think sometimes that can help us. If you're struggling with a sin that just kind of keeps coming up over and over again, take time, again, we talked about this a few weeks ago, to confess it to one another, but then also take time to fast and pray about it, to get victory over it, all right? Now, those are like major reasons to do it, but there's also another reason to do it, just to do it. Just do it on a regular basis. Just as one way for us, as it were, to, um, to enhance our relationship with him. When Jesus was born, you remember his family took him to the temple eight days afterwards, and this is what happened. There was a prophet, or prophetess, really, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, got that? But worshipped night and day. Ah, oh, that's nice of her to, oh wait, what does it say? Fasting and prayer. See that? Part of her worship was to fast. Okay? Okay, let me throw this out to you. What would it be like on a Sunday morning to fast before entering into worship? Just to take that time to pray, say, Lord, what would you have for me today? What would you have? And then they come to the worship service expecting God to speak to you. And it did it just on a regular basis. Okay? We can do that in our, in our lives that we can do that. All right? Now, here's some, some advice. Okay? I'm, I'm finishing up here. I'm just about done. But, but just some practical advice. All right? Start slow. Don't go out of here this afternoon and say, okay, I'm going to do a 40-day fast. <laughs> Don't do it. I mean, unless God really tells you to do that. But I'm just saying to start slow. You need to walk before you run, okay? Take your time. Start with just maybe one meal. Just skip one meal. Try that. And again, as you do that, use it to, to really spend some time with God. Or you can start maybe even doing a 24-hour one. Um, Foster says, he recommends going like from lunch to lunch. So in other words, you eat lunch, then you don't eat supper, you don't eat breakfast, and then you come back and eat lunch the next day. So it's a 24-hour fast. You can do that. And then if you do do, do it, um, you know, start slow like that. I mean, just don't jump right into it. But just take time and just work your way into it and see what God has for you. Also talk to your doctor. Um, some of us, you know, a little bit older and we're taking medications and things like that. Just see what he says or she says and, and, and find out what the doctor has to say. Maybe they'll say, hey, well, you know, in your case, you really shouldn't avoid food. Okay, well then fast from other things. Do a partial fast. You still can do it, but just check with your doctor. And then always remember to fast for the right reasons. And by that I mean you're not trying to be seen by other people. You're not trying to manipulate God. You're basically wanting to say, God, I am doing this so that I can just get closer to you. I want to do this so it enhances my prayer. It enhances my study. It just gives me some extra time with you. Um, that's, you know, that's what we're trying to accomplish. It's basically saying to ourselves, hey, listen, I'm going to let things control me. I'm not going to let things dominate my life. In my life, only one person dominates me, and that's Jesus. King Jesus, reign. Reign in my life. I want to make sure that I allow you to do that. And don't just fast for yourself. Uh, no, by that I mean, yes, it's good for us to do it in private and to do it, but even if we do it in private, there may not be a need in our life, but there may be some needs in our kids' life. There may be some needs in our church life. There may be some needs in our national life. Pray fast even for others. God, hear us. Talk to our kids. Bring them back to you. God, in our church, please move, renew. Re we need revival. We need you to move. In our nation, oh Lord, we're going down a bad, bad path. Pray and fast for others. And then lastly, just do it. Okay? Try it. Come on. I guarantee it will not kill you. 
it might just even help you. It just might bring you a little bit closer to Jesus. And it just might allow you to experience a little bit more what these other spiritual practices can do in our life. Again, to transform us, to bring us to where God wants us to be. Let me close by saying this. Fasting has become, as it were, a lost spiritual practice. But it doesn't have to be. It is probably the main practice that is there for us to enhance all of the other disciplines in our lives. And it shows that food, social media, entertainment are not first in our lives. But that who's first? Jesus. And that we want him to be first. All right, stand. Let's pray together as the worship team will lead us in closing.